Let us all bow. Our Father in heaven, it's once again we assemble, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord. And we pray that everything we do and say is pleasing and acceptable unto you, Lord. We thank you so much, Lord, for the first worship service, Lord. We thank you for the attendance, Lord, and we pray that our attendance will improve, and, uh, improve here at Henry Street, Lord. We pray that we be wise enough to uh, take care to your command, Lord, and uh, do the will that you have set forth unto us, Lord. And we pray on behalf of each and every one represented here, Lord, and all the families that's gathered together in your name, Lord, that you continue to bless us, Lord, and guide our path, Lord, uh, in each and every way, Lord, and uh, keep us from hurt, harm, and danger, Lord, for this is a sinful, cruel, cruel world, Lord, and we also come praying, Lord, for the sick and the shut in, and we pray for Brother Ray, uh, that uh, everything goes well with him, and everything is well with him, and also Sister Kyle, Lord, uh, we pray a special prayer for her. Uh, uh, we know her plate is heavy, and her late is heavy, Lord, we ask that you be with her and all of us around her as she uh, uh, go back and forth dealing with her son. Amen. And likewise, um, uh, the Greens, Lord, who uh, uh, had an a incident with their house, Lord, and uh, we don't know what's set in the future, Lord, and we pray that we do what we can to help the Green family, Lord, for let us all be here for each other, Lord, and uh, do what we can, one for another, Lord. And we ask these blessings that you will be with us uh, in times of need, Lord. And uh, everyone gives the gift that they feel in their heart, Lord. And uh, we pray on behalf of Brother Norwood and Sister Norwood, Lord, and give them safe travel. Give uh, Brother Mitchell and his family safe travel back. And everyone that's traveling. We ask that you be with them, Lord, and these are other blessings we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number 39 and 7 is over. 39.
Talking about a sermon meeting on the twenty. Seven song. Now my aunt will be out of song station. Seven for the sermon meeting on the twenty. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, dwell in me. Again, not literally, but in your heart, maybe throughout the week, if the good Lord sees fit, I shall not be moved. Let's go back to Numbers chapter number 14. I made a clerical error earlier today, and that's why you had the wrong scriptures on the teleprompter up there, if you want to call it that. But we're actually reading out of Numbers chapter 14, not 13. And it's going to be verses 1 to verse number 9 that our brother, uh, one of our elders, and Perry Byers has already read. But I'm going to jump down to verse 5. Numbers chapter 14, verse 5 to verse number 9 is where I'm going to pick up the baton at this point. Only for the simple fact that he's already given you the context. And I wanted him to make sure that he gave you the context. Now let's get to some of the specifics, starting with uh, verse 5 to verse number 9. Again, out of Numbers chapter number 14. And verse 5 goes as follows. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Verse 6 says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, 
rent their clothes. Rip them, in other words. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to, to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, that he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Our concluding verse, verse 9 says, Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. So again, that's the rereading of Numbers chapter 14, verse 5, verse number 9. The whole context is the first nine verses of Numbers 14. And so we're still continuing our Bible character series, but we've got a new gentleman we're going to study uh, this afternoon, being Joshua. And specifically, we're talking about faith among many doubters. Faith among many doubters. Now, folks, some quick background on Joshua. We know that he served two functions, two roles he played for the children of Israel. Obviously, we know that he picked up the mantle after Moses. So he was the successor of Moses. And he was basically a military general. So God put in him wit, he put him in him strategy, and he put in, in him faith to execute the promise of God. So remember that they have already, the children of Israel, that is, have been delivered from Egyptian slavery. They're in the wilderness, and at this point, they're so close to victory, so close to the promised land, as we like to say, they can almost taste it. So they're really on the border of Canaan land. But now they have to go through the fight. Now God brought them through. Now God said, now you got to fight for the land. And so he put the right man in charge, being a faithful man, a skilled man, and a mighty man when it comes to might as far as uh, military and conquest as God had sent him to. So he was both a military general and a spiritual leader all at the same time for the children of Israel. So we're going to take some highlights from his story going forward, good Lord wills, that will make us stronger children of God ourselves. Because again, remember, every time you study Moses, Joshua, the children of Israel story, there's parallels to what you go through in life. So you're going to be able to relate to all that they're going through. Now, before Joshua, though, was the leader of the children of Israel, he marched with Moses in the wilderness. You see that in Numbers chapter 13 and chapter 14, where we are right now. Now, while the children of Israel were still in the wilderness, they had come extremely close, as I mentioned to you, to entering the promised land of Canaan. So again, they're on the border of the promised land right now. And of course, we know that, and I want you to keep this under your belt, I, I can't empirically prove it, but most Bible scholars will tell you that the march from where they were in Egypt to where they were going in Canaan was only 11 days. I didn't say years. I said days, okay? So keep that in mind as you're going to see how things are going to be delayed because of their unfaithfulness to God. Now, of course, when now, now Joshua's not the leader yet. Moses is still alive in Numbers chapter number 14. So he's still an understudy, if you will, of Moses. And so Moses sent out 12 spies into the land, Okay? And so what he was doing was trying to uh, develop a basically a military strategy. He was out there trying to figure out, hey, what does the land look like? Is it what was described by God? And what do the people of the land look like? Now, when you study Bible history, let me tell you something that's left out of Bible history. Remember, when it comes to black folk, we are the sons of Ham. And the sons of Ham also are the sons of Canaan. So what they would have looked like, if you really study world history, when they looked over in Canaan land, they just saw a whole bunch of big old black folk. <laughs> People don't teach you that part. You know, that part has been whitewashed out of history, unfortunately. And so when you study the biblical Genesis, when you look through that land, 
the, the folks that are the sons of Ham, they went to two specific places. They went to North Africa, and they went to the Middle East, which we, they later called the land of Canaan. So for most of us that have African ancestry, you're looking at your cousins. You're looking at folk that look like us. And the Bible says when those spies got over there, they were saying they're too strong for us. And so obviously, I don't know how big they were and all that kind of stuff, but I can imagine in my own uh, I, 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 eyes or imagination, I would see like looking over there and seeing big old Shaquille O'Neal type folk. <laughs> because remember how they described themselves. They said, we look like grasshoppers compared to them. That's pretty small, right? But they're saying that these folk tower over us. These folks are mighty over us. And so obviously then the 12 spies went over there, but 10 of them came back saying, oh no. I don't care what God said. This is not a feat that we're going to be able to accomplish. Huh? You know, we too little. You know, if it was like us, you know, if I put in my own day, look, we all hovering around 5, 9, 8, 6, 9. What we gonna do with that? But you have to understand that if they six nine, God is over ten feet tall. Oh, I'm talking to symbols here. Can I talk like that to you? Yeah. That God is bigger than him. God is their creator, so he know how to take them out of here, right? God is their creator, so he knows who to send out there to take care of them too, right? Think about it this way. If you have allergies like I do, if I get stung by a bee, it can kill me. But I'm a hundred times bigger than that bee. But do you think that bee won't come at me? <laughs> that you know, I've been stung in the stomach by a yellow jacket. They don't scare They're not scared of me. Why? Because they know who they are. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. They have a bigger purpose. See, they're going to make sure that if you mess with me, I mean, if you mess with one of us, you're messing with all of us. And so a bee will what? Take himself out in order to what? Protect the hive. He's dedicated to being a bee. That's what he was made to be, right? And see, obviously then, they, if they would have understood this, talking in symbols, they were God's killer bees. It didn't matter how big or small they were. If God said what? You're going to win? You're going to win. You won't be defeated. You may not know how it's going to get done, but you better walk by faith and not by sight. And you'll get it done, right? But see, the problem was, and that these 10 spies out of the 12, they came back basically with an unfavorable report. Now remember, the real report came from God, right? right. What did he tell them all along? He said, what, I'm going to give you the land of milk and honey. Now they did come back and say, hey, the land is good, right? You know, I'm talking about Joshua and Khalid, right? The ones that were truthful. He said, the land is good, and it truly is a land of what? Milk? And honey, so if they can just solve that part, they can already see that what God told us was true. And so if those parts were true, there were clues to tell you that the rest of what God said was going to get done. Whether you can see it or not. Anybody with me here? Yeah. And you understand the story right now. They did not walk by faith. They instead walked by what? Sight. And that's what messed them up. So remember now, again, before these spies went out there, God promised to give the children of Israel the promised land before they had to go to war with the natives who were the Canaanites of the time. So it should have, have never been any doubt in their minds that they would conquer the Canaanites just because God said it would happen that way. You see, the word of God is more valuable than gold. So there should have never been a lack of faith in their mind. Well, again, the 12 spies went out to see the promised land, and 10 of the 12 spies came back with that unfavorable report. They did not believe that the children of Israel could defeat the Canaanites. And this bad report, it became the influencing factor of the majority of them folks not getting their blessing. Amen. You see, again, God told you. Remember what he said. He said, uh, without faith, it is impossible to please him. If you notice in Joshua's response back in Numbers chapter 14, he said what? If God be pleased with us, I'm paraphrasing, we shall be what? Victorious. That is part of the arrangement. Part of the deal 
that what? We got to believe in God and believe that he is a rewarder of them that what? Diligently seek him. And the only one out of these 12 spies that were diligently seeking him, believing in God, was Joshua and Khalid. They the only ones believed the word of God that the children of Israel could defeat the Canaanites. They believed because they had real faith in what God said. Again, Joshua and Khalid were the only two faithful spies out of the 12 sent. And that makes a big difference. And God was angered by the bad report from the 10 unfaithful spies. He was angered by the lack of faith in these 10 spies and all of the children of Israel who did not believe what he had told them that he would give them the promised land of Canaan. So as a result, God punished the children of Israel. Amen. Remember what I told you. Scientifically, they tell you that it was only an 11-day journey. But the Bible tells us that because they did not believe in the promise of God, which made them not obey and go and fight like they were supposed to, that God made them wander in the wilderness 40 years. Could you imagine that? Your blessing was in front of you for, it only took about 11 days, and now you got to wait 40 years in order to get it. In fact, you're not even going to wait that 40 years. What God was really saying was, I wait till all of y'all die out. They did not believe me. Everybody that was, what, 20 years old or older, God is saying, you got to die out before I even give you the land of Canaan, except for the faithful two, who are what, Joshua and Khalid. Could you imagine that? That everybody, now think about what you're just saying, because typically, in our day and age, that's two generations of people. You know, typically what? Your parents are 20 years older than you, and typically what? Your grandparents are 40 years over you. So what he was saying, I'm taking it a very silly way. Grandma, granddad, mama and daddy got to die. Hmm? Before I bless you. And only you are going to be the ones going in except for two very old gray-headed men that believe. And Joshua and Khalid. Put it in your own setting. And you'll see the story of how that happened. Oh, isn't that something? That's something how God had to do that. And of course, what also the other punishment that was put upon the children of Israel was those ten spies. The Bible says that they, they were able, to, I shouldn't say able, but they contracted the disease sent by God. And all of them died out except for who? Joshua and Khalid. And so they had to miss a blessing because of what? Their lack of faith. Now, Again, the exceptions were Joshua and Khalid. Since they believed in God's promise to give them the land of Canaan, God allowed them to receive it later in Bible history. Now, what do we learn from the 12 spies as we come to a close? Well, we understand that just because the majority of people think something is right does not mean that it is. Amen. Oh, did y'all hear what I'm saying? Amen. Just because a lot of folk believe in something don't make it right. Huh? Man. And so don't, don't ever get caught up in what we call groupthink. Don't ever get caught up in what the majority of think. Folks, as our, our, our parents have told us uh, long ago in the wisdom of Matt saying, they always put in us as kids, you got to be a leader and not a follower. Man. Huh? Because what did Jesus say about them followers? Matthew 15, verse 14, he said, the blind lead the blind, what do they do? Fall in the ditch. the ditch. So you can't let folk influence your faith. Especially when it comes to negativity. Now remember, it's not just folks that, that become your ten spies that can distract you and take you away from your and take you away from God. It can also be a spy of your finances, ain't right? Huh? It can also be a spy of your health, it's not what it's supposed to be. It can be a spy of your fear of losing your job. That can start talking some if I can use these words, some yin yang in your ear, hey? Man. That that you God don't care, that God won't deliver. No, that's not the case at all, right? Remember, what did God tell you, especially when it comes to prayer requests in James chapter number one? He said, let him ask in faith without doubting, right? Because what did he say? He says, the man that wavers, meaning that doubt is what? He shall not receive anything from the Lord. God is telling you that if you want two of these blessings to happen in your life, I'm talking about there's two great blessings that affect every last one of us. And you got to believe until the end to get them. The first one is the earthly blessing. What did he say in Matthew 6, verse 33? Y'all can quote it with me. He said, what? Seek ye first? 
the kingdom of God is righteousness, and what? All these things shall be added unto you. That's talking about the here and now. That's talking about a roof over your head, clothing on your back, food that, that you can eat, uh, uh, water to drink. He's talking about all the necessities of this earthly life. You gotta believe that and respond, right? If you're seeking first, right? In other words, uh, that you want to be saved, right? And living right, God has said, "What? I'm going to bless you." What did Joshua just say? He said, and "When it comes to the promised land, he said, what? If we uh, live right, I'm talking, I'm paraphrasing it, right? He says, what? We shall be victorious. You see, we have a responsibility in all of this, right? And the eternal blessing is John chapter 14, verse one and verse number two, which y'all know well, right? What did Jesus say? He said, let not your heart be choked. You believe in God, believe what? Also in me, in my Father's house of many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I do what? Go, uh, go prepare, prepare a place, that is, for you. So God has made some promises to you, right? The one on the here and now, and the one in eternity. But in other words, you still got to do the work, right? You still got to go in and fight some Canaanites before you get the blessing, right? You got to fight the first Canaanite of what? Discouragement. Don't let time and don't let discouragement, none of that tell you that God won't respond to you. That's a lie. Mm -hmm. Fight off the discouragement of every Canaanite that's in your land, right? For you not to get the blessing. And you will win. Remember, it's not how big the Canaanites are. It's how big your God is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then you'll have your own land of milk and honey. Is that all right now? We're going to end right here. We're going to actually go into this a little bit deeper and, and take out some more things from Joshua's life that can help all of us. And, of course, I think we're beginning by what? Faith being the foundation of it all. But if you're a child of God and you walk your sword, you know what you, what you need to do. In Acts 8, 22 and 1 John 1, 7 verse number 10, you need to repent. You need to change. Confess your fault to God and ask to forgive you. He's going to forgive you right then and there. But if you're not a child of God, you have to respond in faith. In order to be saved. Well, you got to believe. We got to believe God's plan of salvation. It starts with Romans 10, verse number 17. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by what, church? The word of God. You got to believe that word of God. You got to believe what the New Testament says about Jesus Christ, which is condensed in John chapter 3, verse 16, where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him shall not what? Perish, but have everlasting life. And if you believe in Jesus as the Son of God, which also means your Lord and Savior, you must repent of your sins. This is where the fight starts. This is where you face your Canaanites. You see Luke chapter 13, verse 3, verse number 5, Acts 2, verse 38, talk about repentance and what it does. In other words, God said what? Repent so that what? Your sins will be forgiven of you. Repentance just means change. Live righteously according to Jesus' standards and leave a simple lifestyle alone. After you repent, the part of the plan of salvation that comes next is that you've got to confess Jesus as the Son of God, which means your Lord. You'll see that Romans 10, verse 9, verse 10, Acts 8, 37, Matthew 10, 32, and 33, and other passages of Scripture show you that you must confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God in order to be saved. And you must go down in the water grave of baptism. Jesus says that himself. He says it personally. Mark 16, verse number 16. He says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believe it not shall be damned. And of course, after that, you've got to stay faithful unto death. In other words, after you come out of the water and grave of baptism in obedience to the command of God, you're forgiven of your sins, you become a child of God, and you'll be saved if you stay faithful to Jesus unto death. That's what he says in Revelation 2, verse number 10, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of, of life. In other words, keep believing and obeying to the end, and heaven's going to be your home. We just stop and pause for a moment. That is, we'll sing a song of invitation. Let's give you an opportunity to come that out. That out. Give me your hand, God, your heart. I'll ask you a simple question. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We baptize you immediately for the remission of your sins, and you'll be saved uh, if you stay faithful unto death. Won't you come out together? We stand and say the Lord's invitation. Won't you? Have you been to Jesus? What a Are you? Are